Making videos and having a new computer with many times more speed and storage capacity is kind of like being a sailor and riding a jet ski. It feels almost like cheating, but I have to admit, it's a lot of fun. We went out for a joyride after helping to solve a propulsion issue with the sailing club's towing jet ski. Yes, a test ride to make sure that everything was functioning properly. We're usually the ones shaking our fists angrily at the jet skis passing by. You darn expat retirees kicking up all that wake next to our boat. But this time it's our turn to be the jet ski a-holes. This is the messy job where we get dirty water everywhere, but it's worth it because we get a new toilet. It's one of the easiest jobs, fortunately. <laughs> yes. You just remove the pipes, the piping. Oh. Simply remove the piping. Yeah, if that's gonna be easy. Simply remove the six screws. Oh, water came out. But that's uh, actually that's from there. That's just salt water. Okay. Our sophisticated toolkit. Yeah, yeah, that. It's finally starting to wear out. Okay, that's it. That's the part. Ooh. The water here is very calcifying, so another concern for our head repair is removing the calcium encrusted layers before installing the new gaskets. It's a match. Is it? <laughs> yes, I can see the holes. There are two options for repairing these Japsco type toilets. Either a gasket kit, which only includes the little rubber gaskets, or the entire pump assembly. The entire pump kit usually only seems to cost like around 50 bucks more than the gasket kit, so it's usually worth getting the whole thing rather than just the tiny little rubber bits. I have to look that up. No, there's like one screw in the gasket kit as well, I think so. All of these head repair kits only seem to come with one extra stainless steel screw, while the pump needs four screws alone to just fit onto the base. So treat these screws like gold. I would still keep it on this side. Well, that's the safety aspect. It used to be that if anybody forgot to put it in the closed position, our boat could sink. You could come on the boat, put it on the open position, and sink us. After a year, I can leave the boot, not wondering if one of us left it open. After and a year. It's been like, what, two years maybe? How long has it been since we... It's been almost two and a half years. Years, now we have to disinfect ourselves. The shitter repair was a nice reprieve from the heavy lifting and grinding work involved with installing the engine. I lost count of how many times we lifted it in and out to measure and mark off where the mounts will be resting in order for the engine body to be aligned properly with the shaft. We fitted our new coupler that Robbie brought back from Baja, California. When you put it in gear, reverse or forward, there is a, a, a movement, a back and forth movement. You see? Yeah. And if the shaft is connected, what's going, going to move? The what engine? Gears? Yeah. No, the, the thing is that the shaft's going to come out a little bit in the inside every time. When we finally started to cut into the stands, we ran into a tough problem right away. <laughs> Why is the giant still plate in here? We were really thrown off by there being giant and thick metal plates fiberglassed into the engine compartment. Our tools at hand were not going to be enough to cut through it. 
So we moved on to the next challenge. The shaft had many rusted out components remaining on it from the previous coupler and driftless system. Robbie would have to be so careful not to cut through this old rusty stuff and accidentally into the stainless steel shaft. Piece by tiny piece, the rusty bits came off though. The last portion would need to be ground off with the cutting disc. Next to come off was the dripless shaft seal, which had been letting water into our boat for about the last year or so. Without the engine or gearbox in place to push the system towards the stern of the boat, the area was pretty much free flowing. Okay, now we're going somewhere. Oui. We are also currently working on the entire electrical system, and our automatic bilge pump is not in place in order to pump out water. One small metal piece at a time, Robbie removed and then wrapped off the area with old bicycle tubes to slow down the entry of water. Meanwhile, we took a break from this psychological torment of causing more water to flow into the boat. The mounts that we had found, that should be specifically for this weight of engine, were just one millimeter off from fitting inside the engine mount holes. The difference was most likely caused by the engine measurements being metric, while the mounts were imperial sized. To drill through the very hard cast iron of this engine, we would need to apply lots of lube so as to not overheat, dull, or snap the drill bit. Well, again, not ideal or perfect, but half a step forward. With the boat slightly sinking at all times, we pushed on to get the engine installed. But getting through this thick wood and metal wall was eating away at us faster than we could cut away at it. Finally, Ravi held his breath and tackled the area with the cutting grinding disc. A very unpleasant task, but got us moving forward again. Piece by excruciating piece, we chiseled away at the supports, so that the smaller and differently shaped engine would fit into the engine compartment. Time was counting down to the hurricane season. And also, I wanted this engine sitting in the middle of my living room to go back into its proper spot. If I wanted the engine in, it would mean squeezing into this hellishly hot and tiny space to grind and prep the surfaces for incoming wooden supports. It's a good look. 
in the meantime, we moved back to our usual dock after having spent some time at another spot in the canal. When we do this, we usually have to get a tow because at this time of the year especially, there is definitely not enough wind in here to successfully sail the canal with a 40-foot boat. Robbie, by some miracle here, managed to find the right gland packing for the used stuffing box that we would be replacing the dripless shaft seal with. The packing is a waxy rope that presses up against the metal shaft, and then when the stuffing box is tightened, we can essentially have no more water entering the boat through this shaft hole. The day finally came that we mustered the courage to open the old system, let the water flow into the boat, and then quickly swap the stuffing box in. There would be a bicycle tube, rope, and several clamps to remove before swapping in the piece. So we're gonna hopefully easily slip this on. Yeah, hopefully it's the same size. It looks ish, ish, shimonish. Hopefully it's just a question of tooth, tooth. We decided that now was the time because we had just been sent new solar panels. Our electrical system was finally coming together and we had a new 2,000 gallon per hour bilge pump. It was time to put an end to this sketchy ass engine shaft situation in our boat. We thought we were organized, however, not all the tools were at an arm's reach from Robbie while I was manually switching on and off the bilge pump. I need the hammer. Here's rubber and here's my uh, Yeah. Here's real hammer. You can turn the pump on. We know our pump is pretty good. We need a serious hole for we not to be able to keep up. It's meant for this. It's just a matter of our battery power. Okay. Tighten this and it should stop leaking altogether. That's how simple that system is? Yep. And that's already yep. stopped leaking. We put the one old collar from the previous system back onto the shaft just to make sure that the shaft and propeller would not slip down. It was so important to have the bilge pump working for this task. And we are so lucky to have the support of our patrons and viewers. They make these projects possible. Next step would be to build the supports for the engine in the compartment. We have lots of scrap, but very high quality hardwood pieces stored in our bilge. It would mean cutting and epoxying these supports to roughly the right height, length, and width. After sanding every piece down in preparation for the epoxy, I mixed my two to one ratio local epoxy using a water bottle cap and a yogurt container. And then I mixed well with my trusty paint mixing stick. I mixed the thickener in, which consists of a well-sifted recycled sanding dust from our vacuum. It 
squeegee down all the blocks as smoothly as possible and tried to align the wooden blocks with the clamps as evenly and as squarely as possible. them down and they look pretty good without the engine on top. And with the engine sitting on top of them, well, they were going to need some more work. Join us next time for that.